Hey, my friends, it's Matt. Thanks for hanging out with me on my YouTube channel. I'm grinning ear to ear because I've fallen in love with the ancient Persian capital city of Susa. But now I'm frowning ear to ear because it's a forbidden love that can never be. We're just not able to be together. And that breaks my heart, but I'm doing my best to cope. And I suppose that this video is part of the way I'm going to do that. We can't be together because I can't time travel and see her in her full beauty and ancient splendor at her height of grandeur during the Persian Empire from the mid 500s BC to the late 300s BC. I'm further unable to go and be with Susa, my newfound love, because I can't go to Iran. I have a United States passport and it doesn't work very well for me to do tourism there at this point in history. So I'm just going to have to settle for appreciating her from a distance. And that's what I've been doing. All joking aside, I've been immersing myself in ancient stories about Susa from inside and outside of the Bible over the last year. And I'm becoming more and more convinced that this is one of the most interesting places that humans have ever cooperated to build. And part of my fascination with that is just with how many layers of history there is in this town. It's not one single thing. If you've been around history at all, understandably, we associate it with Persia. Why is that? Well, because of the rock star kings who came and went through Susa. Ancient kings everybody's heard of. Cyrus, Darius the Great, Xerxes, his son, Artaxerxes, his son. Well, that captures the imaginations of people and playwrights and artists for you know, the last 2,500 years. So naturally, that is going to stoke our curiosity about Susa and cause us to associate it with Persia. I think we also associate it with Persia primarily, though, because when we meet her in the Old Testament of the obviously wildly influential Holy Bible, she is just having come into Persian hands. She features in the book of Daniel, in the book of Ezra, prominently in the book of Nehemiah, and then the city of Susa features as almost a character unto herself in the beloved, dramatic, high stakes book of Esther. And if you're reading the book of Esther, if you don't make the effort to read between the lines and understand the inhales and exhales, the pulse of this city, you're not really understanding the story. It wouldn't work to take the story of Esther and just drop it in some other town. It only works in Susa. So because of all of that, you think Susa, you think Persia, probably. But here's one of the craziest things that I did not know until recently. When Cyrus the Great, the first king of Persia, the conqueror who established the empire, when he rolled in to Susa, what would that be, 539-ish BC, and he conquered it from the ancient Elamites who had been roughed up by the ancient Babylonians as well. But when he claimed Susa as his own, he was rolling into a city that was probably already thousands upon thousands of years old. Now, some biblical scholars who read the timeline of the Old Testament one way would say, well, it can only be so old because of the age of the earth. Some others who read the timeline of the Old Testament another way and see there as being maybe a little more time there would say that Susa at this point, at the point that is that Cyrus the Great rolled in, may have already been 4,000 years old. Some people say it may have been continually inhabited for almost 10,000 years by the time that Cyrus showed up. You know what? Even if we said only 3,000 years, the evidence doesn't support that. The evidence supports something much older than that. But even if we said that, think about the implications. That would mean that you and I, my friend, as we're sitting here having this conversation about grand old Susa, we are closer to Cyrus the Great taking control of Susa than Cyrus the Great was to the foundation of that same city. Wow. So think about what it must have been like when Cyrus and his officials and his army rolled in there. It must have been enchanting. They would have seen layers upon layers of art and engineering and architecture. They would have seen layers upon layers of little tiny cultural gestures and salutes and niceties that 
nobody would have remembered the origins of, but, but in the preservation of the art and the engineering and the architecture and the style and even some of the social stuff, in that would have been preserved the last memories, the last remnants, the last influences of people groups long since forgotten. Their ghosts still occupied this city in a way that they probably didn't occupy anywhere else. To be in Susa in 539 BC at the beginning of the Persian Empire was to be in a place that echoed of the super ancient, forgotten, distant past. It echoed with the cultural and scientific memory of truths that earlier people groups had figured out that had been forgotten and were only preserved in the tiniest ways with the hints of machines and mechanisms here or there that nobody knew how to work or repair anymore. I think that caught the eye of those early Persian kings, Cyrus the Great, Darius the Great, Xerxes his son, and again, Artaxerxes his son. And I think because of that, they felt like if they wanted to flex their muscles and say, our Persian empire is something completely new to the whole world. We treat the people we conquer better than anybody's ever treated the people that they've conquered. We think in terms of art and architecture and administration and bureaucracy and engineering differently than anybody has ever thought about it. And we are a cosmopolitan empire who doesn't grind our enemies into dust or our subjects into dust. Rather, we welcome them with their styles and their features and their culture to gather to the headquarters of our governance. And they felt like the right headquarters to gather them all to was Susa. They did not choose Persepolis or Pasargadi, two cities that they built up on their own terms in Persian territory further east to be their capital that would truly flex their muscles and communicate what they wanted to communicate. They did not choose the hip, stylish, cool mountain town of Ekbatana, which was the haunt of their old people group cousins, the Medes up north. Nope. And they didn't choose the grand, glorious, wealthy, beautiful, huge ancient city of Babylon to be their primary capital either. Nope. In the early going, these conquerors, these kings of kings who ruled the whole world from as far as you knew about to the very edge of rebel Greek territory, they wanted everybody to come to Susa because they felt like that told the story of their empire. They felt like Susa told the story of how nature and all the gods from the dawn of time had ordained that they would come into this place of prominence and pacify and beautify the entire known world. Well, and beautify it they did. Darius the Great, even more so than Cyrus, his predecessor, loved Susa and he threw money and energy into building up parts of Susa to take on a very distinctive Persian look. And then his son Xerxes inherited that palace complex. And we know from inscriptions on the remains of this complex that Xerxes was faced with a, a difficult decision early in his reign. Do I spend a whole bunch of money and fix this thing up? It's going to cost a lot. Or do I abandon it and go to one of the other cities that I have as an option for a capital? Well, he proudly chose to repair and solidify and expand and beautify his dad's already elaborate, beautiful palace complex there, putting in a hundred columns, arcades and pillars. And you can still see the, I don't even know what you call them, the, the pieces on the top of the columns that would have adorned all of these. There are these beautiful bull and horse sculptures that hold up the ceiling of this palace, this apadana that are I, mean, I think you can see them at the Louvre. Maybe the British Museum has some. I don't know for sure. And I have to imagine there are some still visible in Susa as well today. And the, the artistry and the craftsmanship with which the Persians decorated their version of Susa is still breathtaking to me. These glazed, high color, full color, the, the high definition reliefs that they made of their soldiers, their archers, their subjects, continue to be absolutely gorgeous by any standard of artistry to look at today, even after all of those years of weathering and wear. But it isn't just the Persians who made beautiful things there. They inherited beautiful things. Now, this site of Susa 
has been in the process of being excavated off and on for the last couple hundred years. The French were there for a long time. I have to imagine the English have taken a turn. And the Iranians and UNESCO, the World Preservation Organization, they've all had a hand in unearthing things. Now I think it's primarily Iran that is responsible for that. But along the way, layers and layers of not just construction, but art have been found. There are pieces in the Louvre that I've seen with my own eyes where I can detect the brush strokes on the pottery. I can see the cattails and the reeds and imagine what kind of vegetation grew along the banks of the river upon which ancient Susa was situated. You can feel a connection with the humanity, not just of Persian Susa, but of Elamite Susa, of Babylonian Susa before that, of Assyrian Susa briefly before that, and all the way back into versions of Susa we don't even really have a name for. I think that would have captured the attention of those Persian kings because it captures my attention. Think about how you feel when you go to some ancient part of the world and see things that in your context are unfathomably old. It's a point of connection with our distant past and our distant self that takes your brain to places that you just don't get at the mall or at a movie theater or sitting on your couch streaming something. Well, modern day Susa is unfortunately not much to look at by all accounts. I salute the efforts of the people who've preserved it and tried to build it up. Uh, there is a city still present. I think they call it Shush. At this point, apologies if I'm mispronouncing that. By my understanding, there's about 80,000 people who live all around the ancient uh, capital complex, the citadel of Susa, built up by the, the Persian kings we've been talking about. It sits at a very low elevation, like a couple hundred feet above sea level, and it is boiling hot in the summer at this point in history. I don't get the impression it was that hot back in the day. There have been apparently a few cycles of warming and cooling that, that make it not quite uniform when you look back at history at certain parts of the world that were once fertile, then weren't, then were again, then aren't again. And I think Susa falls into that category. It's not a, a super pleasant place during the warmer months at this point. There were two ancient rivers that ran by there. I believe they still do. Apologies, I don't recall the name, but I'll put them on the screen. They have a different name in the Bible that corresponds to a modern name, but it's not the Tigris and Euphrates. It's sort of the next double river system to the east. But because of the position of those rivers, because of the proximity to, I guess, what would be the Persian Gulf, and because the ancient site of Susa sits right up against the southern end of the Zagros Mountains with defense, you know, providing defense at the backside of the city and also the ability to probably escape the heat a little bit by going up. Because of that, I've got to think that if you started the world over a hundred times, Susa is going to be a place where layers and layers of civilization happen. Why do I think that? Well, because of all that geographical stuff I just said, but also because that's what happened. I mean, think about how many opportunities there were for people to abandon it and just leave. It's like everything just got smashed by these invaders. Everything's ruined now. We should just call it quits. But they didn't. They kept thinking this is a really great site and we ought to do it. And apparently 80,000 people today, even in a scorching moment in history in that part of the world, still think that is the right place to live, which is fascinating. Well, the Persian era of Susa, in all of its splendor and grandeur, comes to a close with the conquest of Susa at the hands of Alexander the Great. Alexander was a Macedonian who was Greekish in culture. He traveled with Greek mercenaries and Macedonian soldiers, and he wiped out what was left of the Achaemenid dynasty. Those are all of the kings I'm talking about and their descendants from Persia. He defeats Darius III at a couple of key battles and ultimately is able to roll into Babylon and then Susa as the conquering liberator of the Persian Empire. In many ways, Alexander the Great is sort of the last emperor of the Persian Empire in that regard. But an interesting thing happened at Susa at the very back end of the Persian era, and that is that Alexander came in, looked at the beauty of the city, and rather than wanting to just absolutely raise it to the ground, I mean, they looted the city, but rather than wanting to just destroy it and move on, 
he thought this would be a great site to put a historic blessing on the union of our people. And so he married a couple of Persian princesses at Susa, and then he did a mass wedding at Susa for a whole bunch of his Macedonian and Greek soldiers and travelers to a whole bunch of Persian women. And the idea was, let's just merge these two cultures once and for all. Now that had been going on for the past couple hundred years. The Greeks and the Persians had a whole bunch of cultural exchange. In fact, the name Susa is the Greek name for that city. The old Persian name would be pronounced very differently, and I suppose I won't even try it here. And so that to me is the window that enchants me from Cyrus the Great and the day that he rolled in and would have marveled at at this time capsule, this preservation of all of the history of human civilization. And between that and the mass wedding that Alexander the Great had shortly before his death there, I think it would be amazing at any point in history to get to use one of my imaginary time travel tokens to go back there and to see all of that in all of its glory and to appreciate what really probably was the most beautiful, most important city on earth for a chunk of time and one that has found a way somehow to scratch out an existence through all of the ups and downs of history. Last thing that I think is really fun about Susa is that she has not yet revealed all of her secrets. There was a ton of excavation in the 1800s, more in the early 1900s. Beautiful things were found that you can still see all around the world in museums, but a huge percentage of what was built by the Persians and their predecessors is still out there under the sand and the encroachment of urban development has probably caused a whole bunch of modern stuff to be sitting right over the top of things that would unlock and, and solve some of the great mysteries about the Persian Empire and the things that happened in this town and maybe even our very, very, very distant human past. And I'm hoping that somewhere in my lifetime, I might get to learn more about what secrets she still holds. Fun, fun, fun. Thank you for thinking about Susa. Hopefully I've convinced you that it's as cool as I think it is. And maybe you even feel a teeny tiny little spark of love for this ancient city as I do as well. I'm Matt. Thanks for hanging out with me. Let's do this again soon.